So, hello, Amy. Wonderful to be here with you, Shai. Yes, yes. It's sheer joy to be together and to begin to explore the, the, th the theme of all meditatively and experientially uh, together. And uh, uh, this is actually the very first interview, the very first reason for feeling awe that we're going to introduce to our readers and uh, listeners and viewers. So, uh, so that's, that's a, a, a tremendous source of delight. I'm honored to be the first and to join you in this gorgeous <laughs> effort. So you told me uh, before that, that for you, it's almost uh, uh, difficult to, to discern a particular phenomena uh, um, that, that, that would be a source uh, of awe for you, because for you, this is a, a kind of a continuous state. Right. So, but 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 uh, still, I, I would start by asking you, if you had to choose for the sake of this interview, for the sake of this exploration, what would be one good reason for feeling awe? The one phenomena that that fills your heart with a sense of wonderment and that leaves you humbled by the world around you or the world within you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll speak to the first and then to the specific of your question. So I, I, I was reflecting on awe and anticipating our interview, and I was thinking, in some ways, awe is a choice one makes of how to relate to the dimensions of grace in your life. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you have a kind of orientation to recognize that everything you've been gifted is full of awe, is full of an expression of the divine presence whether it's music or the beauty of nature or the intimacy of a moment with a friend in you know, sharing the deep interiority of your life or an opportunity to create something with someone or uh, you know, just uh, the simplest acts of travel, of dining, of cooking, of uh, every, everyday acts can be mm -hmm. awe-filled if that's the stance you choose to meet them in. Um, so in, in some ways, I think it's true that there's awe available to us in many, many moments. Um, and, and that the, the threshold for awe, meaning I, I recognize this as a grace, I recognize this as an expression of beauty, I recognize this as, as an expression of love. That's what I think one means by awe, to have that mm. reverence. And mm. I, I do feel like you can cultivate that reverence and mature it inside your heart. Um, and as you know, I had uh, cancer very young, and I think the, that early connection to the ephemeral nature of life or the impermanence of life seeded in me a kind of cultivation of gratitude uh, at the just mm. the opportunity to engage with life and be met by life and fed by life and, and, and offered to life um, that has sort of an element of awe in it. Um, but since you're asking me to pick one... I, I, <laughs> I think I'll pick the all I feel when I get to know another person's story mm. and see the unique beauty of somebody's specific journey in life. Mm. I am over and over and over again touched by the qualities of the human soul. And I think that's probably the thing that I find the most awe in. Mm. Yeah. I see that. That's 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 a very intriguing uh, choice. Co could you please uh, guide us through some kind of of of, of journey? Be because because not all of us are, are able to to be touched so deeply by another's story, uh, um, the especially the meaning you ascribe to it as as glimpsing into someone's uh, depth of soul. So so could you could you uh, Elaborate on that and, and, and make it clear why this is a source of awe. Yeah. <laughs> Let me think for a second. Well, implicit in what you said is something maybe worth being explicit about, which is in order to receive another story, I have to have done a certain amount of my own inner work to be capable of listening to anything to be an invitation to share whatever they've walked. Um, and since most people's lives includes a lot of pain or a lot of struggle, 
and that's the journey most of us have been on. Um, you have to have done enough of your own inner healing work to be able to encounter that pain with an open heart. Um, so I think it's true that that the fact that I've walked my own inner development path for a long time mm -hmm. makes it possible for people to share more of the truth of their lives than they would otherwise. Um, I think there's a second quality of receptivity that's worth naming, which is um, being able to see that any encounter could be that fertile exchange. Hmm. So I have the privilege of having profound conversations in what would be seemingly ordinary and casual encounters um, because I don't have the expectation that they will remain superficial. I really believe because I bring a quality of awe and interest to those conversations that um, if you just create a little more room and a little wider invitation, people are eager to share something of who they really are, what they value, what matters to them, what inspires them, what threatens them, what, you know, what they what they custodian inside themselves. Um, so I, I guess part of the reason I find the process awesome is that I know that it's a dance between me and the other person. How big is my on-ramp to the conversation? And how, you know, wide is my embrace has something to do with what is then granted me. Um, by the other person, there it, it's not neutral how I'm. People meet me, mm -hmm. meet them. It's it's a co-creative act. Um, so part of the awe is it's sort of making the implicit, tacit consent to me, to meet, to really encounter, and to emerge something together. Um, mm -hmm. So that moment when there's a spark of recognition, soul to soul, oh, we could choose to step in here and really find each other. That's a moment of awe, I think. <laughs> and when somebody grants you that license, that's a very blessed moment. Um, so that's the first thing I would say. I think the second is, um, I really believe that the purpose of the journey of life is evolutionary, is for each of us to learn. So mm. what, what that would suggest is that listening to anyone's story and the meaning they make of it is an education in, in getting wiser. Um, it's a chance to, through osmosis, through absorption, through fascination, through a willingness to be moved, the life they have journeyed can become a source for your own evolutionary uh, of consciousness. Um, so there's something very beautiful about the learning opportunity to meet someone. I also think it's a healing opportunity because we know that much of the difficulty in life mm. happens from feeling alone in whatever your struggle is, feeling too isolated, not uh, sort of the separate sense of self feeling uh, identified with its own aloneness. So the alchemy out of that is relation. The alchemy out of that is intimacy. The alchemy out of that is to be cradled in your life experience. Mm -hmm. So when two people pause and take the time to really listen to each other, really listen to each other, I think there's something intrinsically powerfully healing in that. And that's also awesome, you know, to just watch somebody's fear start to melt, to watch somebody's shield start to drop, just watch somebody, you know, it's almost like an, a hand reaching out to meet another hand and that point of connection, something, yes. both hands change. Um, mm. Yeah, yeah mm. So that's at least that's, a, that's, a bit of the music of that. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Uh, so, so, I would perhaps suggest that, that that you are finding awe in in the experience of true dialogue. Is that right? Could you uh, could you hmm, could, could you speak a little about about what listening uh, means to you and what dialogue means to you? Sure. Um, uh, one of my teachers, Thomas Hubel, says listening is listening as if you have eyes all over your body. And I really, I really mm. love that. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a, a skill one has to learn and um, mm. commit oneself to. But it, in fact, what it means is opening your entire energetic field to receive the other person. Because people, people transmit who they are and what they've walked, not just verbally, but paraverbally, energetically, esoterically, psychically. Um, so when you can uh, take somebody in, mm. That's the beginning of the dialogue. Um, mm. And uh, I think the other part of that is being willing to share with people the things that in society we're told are not welcome. 
um, you know, to really say, here's where my brokenness lives. Here's the things that scare me. Here's the things that have really shattered me. Here's the things I long for. Here's the things I doubt about myself or about life. Like to share the terrain uh, that has historically in our society anyway, mm. been privatized. Um, to share that in more of the commons, I think um, will rewire community in life. And uh, I think, you know, the notion it takes a village is true. We can't heal alone. Um, we have to start rewiring the ways that we create the social fabric of our connections. Um, and that kind of dialogue where you tell me who you really are and what's your cutting edge and you take me into your inner life. And I offer that same vulnerability and willingness to be raw and truthful. Um, I think it does create a kind of mutual space that is pregnant with life, pregnant with awe, um, and pregnant with the possibility of something new emerging between mm. us that is more than the just synergy of our lives. It's the alchemy of that moment uh, connected to everything we bring to that moment. And, mm. you know, I have the privilege of being a friend of yours, and I can say every moment I get to spend with you is quite like that, pregnant in mm. that way. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> that, that's a, sh a completely shared experience. So we, because because I, I indeed can can, can appreciate the, the way you are listening and 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 being so completely engaged in a, in a, actually an unfamiliar uh, a type of depth mm -hmm. uh, in in a, a state of conversation. So so in, in what sense uh, does that open someone else's uh, doors this kind of uh, of listening this kind of because you're talking about this this uh, therapeutic dimension of the dialogue mm -hmm. right uh, and what 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 uh, how do people respond in a way that that actually um, um, becomes a source of awe mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. So I have the privilege of running a lot of workshops for mm. leaders. And in the workshops, it's not unusual, Shai, that they come in on the opening night, very guarded, very exhausted, very um, self-contained in a way you might describe it. And um, the invitation in, in these programs um, is really to help people stop the superficiality of their lives stop referencing their meaning and their goodness by their accomplishments, by the prestige of their roles, by the quality of their lifestyle, and start understanding their intrinsic worthiness um, mm -hmm. from a much deeper place inside themselves. And as people turn from a, a life that's really shaped by cultural assumptions and norms and goals to much more of an inner driven um, set of values, set of um, motivations, set of, you know, increase their self-contact. There's just some qualities of who they really are that are invisible in the opening night that start to unfold in front of your eyes over the course of the week. Qualities of compassion, qualities of playfulness, mm. qualities of creativity and whimsy, um, qualities of depth of emotion you know, many, many facets of what's gorgeous about the human being um, mm. that are literally covered over, like they have like a gray veil over them by the way that we operate so much of the time. And when you put them in a, seep them, saturate them in a contact <laughs> field that says, no, you know, you don't have to be so buttoned up. Um, you could actually just unleash who you are and speak from a soulful place and dance from a soulful place and, you know, engage each other from a, a really the gravity of what we're here to discover. Um, mm. It's it's literally awesome to watch people come alive. It's like, I don't know, it's like they, they're, they're absorbing the liquid gold of love and that love is a, a potentializer. Um, mm. it, and, and I also would say that in that field of love, they start to be very articulate about things that are important. Um, and they, in that heightened sense of coherence and trust and ease with each other, they, the whole quality of conversation and the quality of the sort of invisible points of connection that you can feel, but you can't quite see 
um, the field becomes very different. It's very, it's quite beautiful. I, it moves mm. me to tears almost every time, actually. Yeah. And I know, mm -hmm. I know that they will go home and lead differently. They will mm. lead their organizations with all of those qualities of kindness and presence mm. and accessibility. And perhaps much more importantly, they will be more responsible to their families, to their children, to their communities, to the context mm. in which they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. That aliveness is a permeated force field in the rest of their lives, in every context that they will walk into. So part of the awe is anticipatory awe, because I know that it's setting in motion a river that will run for a long time and mm. have many different tributaries of beauty. So it's it's the awe of watching somebody come home. Yeah. Mm. I see. I see. At so, start the journey home. Yeah. So, the, would you say that that you are simply allowing something to be revealed, something that is already there, that 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 pre-exists, and you are just there? Uh, um, would you say that, or yes. is it something <laughs> that that is actually uh, uh, developed as a result of of the interaction? No, I think it's more the former. I think, mm. in fact, I think we normally live in a state of grace and love and wonder, um, but that it's constrained by trauma and pain and hurt that has been unattended to. And because we aren't tending to that hurt, we do many things to numb ourselves or disconnect ourselves from our pain. And the reason that we don't see a world that's exploding with awe and wonder isn't because we're not hardwired for awe and wonder. It's because mm. there's so much untreated pain and so many sort of micro behavioral hacks that keep us outside ourselves, that that distance is the gap between me in a moment of awe and me in a moment of dullness. Um, but no, I don't think we're adding anything. I think we're creating mm. a kind of um, permission mm. for, for people to dwell in the depth of who they are naturally. Actually. Mm. Mm. And this is not uh, obviously done through a, a, a technique or, or something intentional, or, or is it? Is it just a, some kind of, of the result of a, a pure interest? Mm. I think that's an, I, I would answer that as an and. I do think the quality of imminence in the room, like just the level of um, attention we want to pay to each person, the level of intention we're holding for how profound something is that could happen. Um, all of that is part of the um, context in which the unfolding happens. And of course there are practices, you teach many of them, that are doorways to that kind of aliveness or feeling mm -hmm. of heartedness mm -hmm. and awe. You could do a, a, a meditation on loving kindness. You could do uh, you know, a journaling of your life story and look for key moments and the sort of meaning that they had for you. You mm -hmm. can talk to each other about your life journeys. Um, you could dance, you could do martial arts, you could do mindfulness practice, you could listen to poetry, you could play music. We do all of those. Um, <laughs> uh, we do the programs in beautiful settings and nature does a great deal of the all work, right. um, mm. we could argue. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think there are there are ways to devote yourself to practices that are uh, alivening and illuminating mm. um, and, and are useful. But at the end of the day, it's really love. I mean, if we had to be simple about it. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. So it's it's love that is behind this type of listening. Yes, but it's not love in a soft sense. It's love in a quite precise sense. Meaning it's not just that I'm willing to theoretically have an open heart. It's that as a practitioner, I've done enough of my own work to be hmm. able to take that heart and extend it to you in a way that is not diluted by my natural judgments of myself or you, is not clouded by my own terror and my own fear in the moment that you bring me your story, um, doesn't need to make mm -hmm. something happen or pressure you to move any faster than your heart is safe to open. That's a very important one. I don't take my success as whether or not you open. So I'm not invested in pushing past your defenses. Um, I really honor people's defenses. And I think that bow that anything they're doing to guard themselves is a really intelligent uh, survival strategy that they learned earlier in life. It's just that moment is an invitation to test, is that still needed? Is that still necessary? Hmm. 
or is something else possible? Um, mm -hmm. But it's very different to approach that defense with a understanding of how significantly life-saving it was once upon a time than approach mm -hmm. that defense as something to be dismantled or something to be discarded. Um, so there's lots of nuance um, to what it means to be in a state of love and receptivity. Um, and I think some of the problems in the craft of transformational change is that too often people sort of new age simplify it. Um, love is actually uh, an art form uh, or this kind of love is anyway. Mm -hmm. And creating conditions. Yeah, creating mm. the right conditions. Mm -hmm. And yes. there's something also about um, helping people move from day uh, everyday time to eternal time. So a program like this really lives in a state of grace itself. Um, you, you know, you invite people to pull out of their daily life, to pull out of their to-do list, mm. to pull out of their day-to-day -day interactions. Um, so you're creating, as you said, the preconditions for something elevated to happen. Mm. Yeah. That's wonderful. Now, could, could you lead us to, to a moment uh, or moments that, that you, you have uh, uh, experienced uh, uh, in, in your in your uh, perhaps uh, processes of, uh, of guidance uh, uh, or in, in, in your everyday life uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to some moments, certain moments in which you, in which someone opened up in a way that, that uh, filled you with this kind of uh, awe and wonderment. <laughs> sure, I'd be so happy to. Uh, two came to mind immediately when you were speaking. Um, hmm. Uh, so I had a gentleman come into our, my program about six months ago who was very cynical and for whom self-exploration was not a natural mode of uh, <laughs> hanging out. Um, and uh, the programs are often done on the floor on backjacks and, you know, sort of very casually comfortable to make people feel more at ease and less formal. Mm -hmm. And he walked in and saw us on the floor and I saw the thought flash through his brain. I'm out of here. <laughs> And I thought, oh, it's not obvious he's going to stay. Um, and he didn't sit on the floor for the opening night. He sat in the back and he had his arms <laughs> sort of crossed. And you can see he was just sort of assessing, is this, you know, too weird for me? Um, and, uh, and then uh, overnight, I attribute that some part of his deep yearning for uh, truth and freedom made a choice to really give himself to the program. Mm -hmm. And Monday morning, he was deeply uh, willing to and, and activated to start the process of self-discovery. And on the third day, um, he raised his hand and asked me a question that I, I'll never forget. I, it, it still gives me chills. He said, Amy, can I ask you something? And I said, yes, yes, of course. And he said, um, from really from the center of his heart, he said, I'm a ruthless man. I'm ruthless to my teams. I'm ruthless to my partner. And I'm ruthless to my children. And I'd like to know how to stop that. For me, a question like that is a moment of awe. Because that man, it came to be revealed, came from generations of clinical depression, alcoholism, mm -hmm. or trauma after trauma after trauma in his lineage. And unless he ever asks that question, that will simply pass along to his children and their descendants and listen to time. But when he asks that question, and it gives me goosebumps to talk about, when he asks that question, how do I stop? How do I make sure it ends in my generation? You rewrite the book of life. Hmm. So that's, that's one such moment. And I've truly been honored to have many, many, many such moments in these programs. Hmm. Like you just literally see before your eyes, somebody making a choice in that in one generation to change the future for their entire family and also all the people they lead for sure. Um, a, a much more personal one, I, I was uh, in Israel last week and I was in a car from the taxi to the hotel, very casual seeming encounter with the driver. And a few minutes into the conversation, he started talking to me about his um, teenage daughter, who's uh, very dangerously depressed. 
Um, and I'm sure many of your listeners know there's a pandemic now of adolescent uh, self-harming and depression and suicidality mm -hmm. coming out of COVID. It's something I'm very worried about and very alert to um, and happen to have a lot of resources for. And so we spent the whole ride, you know, once he opened the door of that conversation, me getting a chance to better understand what she was struggling with and what was going on for her and, and for him and the family and what resources they need. And, you know, I was pretty swiftly able to put some things in place that I hope will be meaningful to her. Um, but the story is not awe inspiring because I helped. I mean, there's many, many chances all of us have all day to help. Mm -hmm. It's awe inspiring to me to see how little of an invitation he needed mm -hmm. to talk mm -hmm. about what really mattered to him. Mm -hmm. and that what could otherwise be seen as a transactional exchange. He drives me to the airport. I pay him some shekels. I get out from the airport, right? It yes. doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that. Any encounter, any encounter can be a soul encounter. And I find that awesome. I really, it's you can taste life's richness so much more fully than we give ourselves permission to or believe is even possible. So those would be two examples. I'm so touched by your profound faith in the uh, faith in the in the inherent goodness of humans. I do have right that. because I think that's that's really a, a profound experience for you. Yes. a profound knowing. Yes, and I think in part it's very beautiful that you name that, Shai, because I want to unpack why that's true. Hmm. When you've had the chances I have to do a lot of trauma healing work with people you start to see the close connection between what looks like not goodness, right? The behaviors that we would traditionally call uh, mean or curt or disrespectful or mm -hmm. you know, patronizing literally come from a childhood in which that was the inevitable byproduct. And once you see it in its full life cycle, it's very hard to be in a judgment mode of those behaviors or to attribute to the behaviors that you're seeing as dysfunctional and destructive as they are. I'm not saying they're acceptable or that we shouldn't challenge them or that we don't need to address them. I'm saying quite the opposite. You can't address them by judging them and scolding them and punishing them. You have to address them by going to the source and you have to address them by saying, I really wanna know why this is happening. I really care and know there's something much brighter and much freer inside you that is not going to act this way when we access it. Hmm. So that deep faith is, is part of the medicine, what you're pointing to. It's very important to name that. It's, hmm. it's a confidence in the intrinsic goodness and also a very strong firsthand knowledge of the extreme pervasive aftermath of trauma in people's behavioral repertoires. Hmm. And, hmm. Yeah. If you connect the dots, mm -hmm. then you have to, you equally have to be in awe of the beauty of the human spirit and also the strength, like what people live through and yes. keep their moral compass or their desire to be connected and held intact in some part, in some place in their heart, they keep that intact. And if you can just pour a little water to that place, mm -hmm. a flower comes, it, it just inevitably comes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for these words. Now, for, for my last question, how can the, the rest of us, because this is so, so extremely uh, natural for you. I, I know that it's hard won, right? And I know that that is the result of, uh, of a great deal of experience and also some traumas. But uh, uh, this is still, I think it is, it is intrinsically uh, natural for you. So how can the, the rest of us tap into this uh, type of, of profound sense of wonder? Uh, could, could we take a, a certain steps to, to become more deeply uh, capable of, of listening to, to others and, uh, and helping them to, to reveal this, this awesome dimension of their being? Oh, I love that question. I'm gonna give you a counterintuitive starting place. Find someone to listen to you. Um, uh, so many of us have untold stories and uncharted 
territory in our own hearts. And if we've never had the for good fortune of being well received and well held, it's very hard to offer that. You need to, you know, sort of offer that from a full cup of having been well heard. So I think the first step is actually to go look for someone who will accompany you in, in your own exploration of your life and your mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. um, and that when that feels well fulfilled, it's much more natural than to make the outstretched hand that you're describing. Mm. Uh, I think the second thing is something you do very naturally. Listen to be moved. You know, don't listen from your mind. Don't listen from behind a shield. Listen from a open heart, open body, open soul. Um, and you'll notice that you hear much more, um, not just hmm. because you literally are have more facets of listening turned on, but because that openness transmits to the other person as a wider invitation. Um, that's the second thing. I think the third thing is to be willing to say things that are unexpected and that you've never said before. Um, because when you enter novel terrain, there's a kind hmm. of electricity that uh, mm. brings fresh fresh conversation um so even you know these wonderful questions that you're asking me are producing answers in me that i've never explored before mm. Mm. that makes the conversation i think have a certain kind of vitality or joy right. Right. Um, so let it be unexpected let it you know enter the mystery together would be another practice i would say um something super concrete would be Make a list of five questions that intrigue you so that you bring your own curiosity to the questions and your own cutting edge to the questions or questions that you're grappling with in your own life that you'd like counsel and advice on and ask those um, mm. so that there's, you know, you have some investment in having the conversation deepen and have texture. Um, and I think the last one is um, let there be silence. Hmm. Yeah. It's very hard to have a conversation permeate you and the other person if the space is cluttered with words. Um, it's it's much more likely that it will soften into something numinous if you give it a little more space. Hmm. I find it so meaningful that, that the first reason for feeling awe that we're presenting in this project is, is dialogue itself, is, the, is this kind of encounter between two uh, awestruck people, two, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Yes, yes. So thank you for, for yeah, making... It's kind of luscious, really. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes. <laughs> thank you for having me, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amy, for, for this uh, 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 profoundly heart-opening, heart-widening discussion. Thank you. My pleasure, really.